Hi, this is Callie Chappelle, and welcome to this video about DNA's footprinting. This is made for MCDB 427, which is Molecular Biology at the University of Michigan. So in this class, we learned two key assays for protein-DNA interactions. The first is the EMSA, and the second is DNA footprinting. And while EMSA tells us, does a protein bind, DNA footprinting answers the question, where does a protein bind? And this is really critical to making, EMSA, or making DNA footprinting a very powerful tool in understanding these protein-DNA interactions. Now, this video, I want to give a quick overview of the technique, and then I'm going to zoom in and talk about the details of the method. The first thing I want to show you is why it's called DNA footprinting. So here is a DNA footprinting gel, and it's it's just a it's just a DNA gel. So even though we're looking at the protein DNA interaction, the thing we're actually going to be seeing is DNA. But what's cool is is when a protein is added, it leaves behind this footprint. If the protein is added and it binds to DNA, it leaves this footprint. So here is the treatment without any protein added, and here is with a protein that assumably binds to DNA. And it, there's this funny gap which we call a footprint. And you can imagine inside of that gap, that is where a protein binds. And each one of these bands represents a one nucleotide difference in the, D in the actual DNA. Let me show you what I mean by this. So imagine that we have a population of DNAs, and every DNA is the same in this population, all right? So, so perhaps it's just amplified by PCR. And when we add our protein, our protein will bind to these DNAs. Then we treat with DNAs, and remember, DNAs cleaves DNA, and that's why this is called DNAs footprinting. And so DNAs will come and cleave this DNA. Now, instead of using a, a ton of DNAs, which would just cleave everywhere, we use what's called a limited DNA treatment. And what that means is we want a treatment that will cut each DNA exactly once. And we don't want it to cut at the exact same place. Instead, statistically, DNAs will cut at one random location on every single DNA, which I've shown here. So here, DNAs is cutting at the plus, at the third nucleotide or the third base pair. Uh, um, and this one, it's cutting at the ninth base pair. Here, it's cutting at the plus seven, at the seventh base pair, etc. Um, so what will happen is we'll get a we'll get a population of cuts at at every single nucleotide, but just once per DNA. So, for example, here, when DNA is cut, we would get a piece that um, is three nucleotides long. Let's see here, DNA is cut at four, so we get a piece that's four nucleotides long. So we get a product that looks like this. I just drew these these blue lines just so I could easily um, make them all the correct length. Here, DNA is cutting at plus seven, so I'd get a piece that that is this length. And so, so we get a variety of just randomly, random length DNAs as a result of this DNA treatment. Here, let's just do one more for posterity. This one's plus 11, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And each of these fragments that are produced from this DNA treatment are, are radio labeled. Now, imagine that we run this out on a gel. And so when we run DNA in gel, you know it gets separated by size. So I've just reorganized what I've drawn here, um, if I had done all of them, into, uh, into by size, right? So you've got the first one is one plus one, right? It's one nucleotide. The next one is two long. The next one's three long. The next one's four long, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, where each one gets longer by one. But remember, a protein is bound is bound to this DNA. And when a protein is bound, DNAs can't cut it where the protein is. Right? DNAs will try to cut it, but it won't be able to because it's protected by this protein. And so what will happen is for particular particular strands of DNA, um, if, if DNA is, is quote unquote trying to cut at the seventh base pair, but it's protected by the protein, it simply can't cut, so it won't get cut there. So what I've shown is there are some places where there aren't cuts, right? So there is no piece, there is no piece, there is no DNA product here that is seven nucleotides long because the seventh nucleotide or the seventh base pair is covered up by this protein. And so when this is run on a gel, when there is no protein, you should get a cut at every single location. But when there is a protein, there won't be cuts at particular locations because the protein is covering it up. I, now, now that you kind of understand the intuition behind why this gap occurs because the protein is binding, I'm going to go into some of the details about the method of DNA's footprinting. 
The first thing is end labeling, and this was something that I really struggled understanding, and not necessarily the process of end labeling, but rather why end labeling is so important in the context of DNA's footprinting. So the first thing we have to do is to be able to see our DNA, because remember, even though we're assaying DNA protein interactions, what we're going to be looking at is the DNA, so that DNA needs to be labeled. And it can't be labeled just anywhere, it needs to be labeled on the end. And there are a couple of key stipulations about how it gets unlabeled. Now, a quick side note on unlabeling, I'm not going to go into the process of unlabeling because the understanding how the unlabeling actually occurs isn't really that important for understanding DNA's footprinting. But you still need to understand that, so I would highly recommend watching the unlabeling videos in order to get that intuition. Now, for the purposes of DNA footprinting, there are two things about unlabeling you need to know. The first is that only one strand is labeled. So we don't want we don't want two strands labeled, we just want one. Alright, that's bad. And the second thing is that you could label either strand. So it doesn't mean you doesn't have to be this strand that's labeled, it could be this strand that's labeled, it just can't be both. Or it could be the five prime end, or it could be the three prime end. But whatever you do, it must be consistent throughout the experiment. So remember, we start out with that entire population of DNAs. All those DNAs need to be labeled in the same way. They all, in this case, need to be labeled with the top and the left side, right? But you can't have, like, a mixture of them. And that's what I'm saying here, that all that matters when you read the gel is whether the label is to the right or the left of the protein binding. And why would this be? I've tried to draw a little diagram that will show that will show you exactly why. So imagine that we have a protein. We have the same protein, we have the same DNA, but all that's different is what end it's labeled. Here it's labeled on the left side of the protein, and I know left to right is kind of arbitrary, but just based on how I've drawn this, and here it's labeled on the right side of the, of the protein on the DNA. So we do our DNA's treatment, right, and we get a bunch of fragments, and so in this case, if it's labeled on the left side, the DNA's fragments um, near the plus one are going to be the smallest, the DNA's products, I guess, um, the products of getting cut by DNA's, will be small near the plus one and big near the plus nine. However, if, it, if, if the starting DNA is labeled on the right side of the protein, the small ones are going to be near the plus nine and the big ones are going to be near the plus one. So what we can actually do is, based on the size of the fragments, if they're aligned to the sequence, so we know that this, is, this one represents plus one, this one represents plus nine, um, then we can actually tell whether the, the DNA was labeled to the right or the left. And I'm going to give you an example of that at the end of this video. So after we unlabel the DNA, that was a big introduction to unlabeling, because it's so important, then we add our protein, so our protein binds. And then we treat with limiting DNA. So we already talked about this a little bit, but I'm going to go into some depth about it right now. So the limiting DNA treatment, remember, cuts each strand once at some random location. And even though it's cutting at a random location, in total, statistically, you should get at least one fragment of each size in the total population. So I've drawn that here. So we've got a population of DNAs that are all labeled the same way, and we've, we're treating with limited DNA, so each DNA gets cut exactly once at some random location. Right, so I've drawn here kind of what the total population of, of cleavage products should be after treating with DNA. So where we've got a bunch of we've got a bunch of different size fragments, each one different by one nucleotide. Let me show you what this means in the context of a protein binding or not binding. So here we go. We've got a a, a an example piece of DNA that's labeled on one side. All of them are labeled the same way on the same strand. On the same side <laughs> and just imagine that this DNA is six nucleotides long now this is way too short you're never actually gonna see this but I just for simplistic purposes just made it six nucleotides all right so we've got nucleotide one two three four five six and same here one two three four five six all right it's not exactly lined up perfectly so let's take a look at what happens when we don't have a protein. So we've just got our naked DNA here, and we're treating with DNAs, our limiting DNAs. So let's just say randomly this guy on this strand, DNA is cut at the first nucleotide. At this DNA, DNA is cut at the third nucleotide. At this DNA, it cuts at, DNA is cut at the sixth nucleotide, and so on and so on, until we get a variety of of these products, which I've shown here in green. Now, these are just a product of this double-stranded DNA, but I just want to draw them in green so you could see so you could see them a little bit better. And let's see what happens when we add the protein. So we've got our protein, and our protein is covering up our plus three, our plus three uh, nucleotide.
So again, we've got just random cutting by DNA. So DNA cuts this guy at plus one. DNA cuts this guy at plus four. It cuts this guy at plus six. It cuts this guy at plus five. And hey, maybe DNA tries to cut this guy at plus three, but plus three happens to be covered up by this protein, so DNA doesn't cut. So we don't actually get a, we don't get a, a cleavage product from this. So now I'm just going to kind of just erase all of these double stranded um, uh, quote unquote inputs. Um, from your mind, and I'm just going to draw all of these, right, all of these. Let's see what those products would look like. So in the limiting DNA treatment without the protein, we're going to get cleavage products at every single nucleotide, one at every single nucleotide. Um, so we get one of different lengths, each one different length, each one one longer, one nucleotide longer than the last one. But when we have protein, there is a nucleotide in this case, or usually a, n a number of nucleotides that are that are protected by the protein, so DNAs can't access them. That means that we're going to be missing some length uh, products because the, those nucleotides were covered up by the protein. Okay, so in this case, number three nucleotide was covered up by the protein. This was number three, and so we don't get a number three cleavage product. We don't get cleavage at number three because it's protected by the protein. So after we do our DNA, our limited DNA treatment, what happens next? Then we remove our protein, we denature the DNA to make it single-stranded, and then we run out on a gel. Based on this example, what would that gel look like? Well, here we go. We've got our gel, and this is A is, is no protein, B is with protein, and C is unlimiting DNA. And we'll save C for a little bit. Let's just focus on A and B right now. So A, we know we would expect to see um, each band to be one nucleotide different in length. And we would expect number five, so when it cuts at number five, if it's labeled on this end, those are, that's going to be, or I'm sorry, number five or number six to be, here's number six, I'm going to draw six up here, it should be six, is going to be the longest, and one will be the shortest, so one will be down here and six will be up here. And we, we should expect to see with no protein protecting one cut at every nucleotide. Now with B, when we have a protein binding, we're going to be missing a couple of bands where that protein is bound. So we'll know the protein is bound here, and it's covering up nucleotide 3. Now remember, we use a limiting DNA treatment. This is something that I was try really trying to emphasize. What would happen if we added unlimiting DNA? So, well, the reason why we use limiting DNA is where we so we only get one cut per piece. But if we have unlimiting DNA, if we use unlimiting DNA, each strand is going to get cut multiple times because there's just so much DNA around, right? It'll cut here, it'll cut here, it'll cut here, 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 here. So what we'll get is just a bunch of one nucleotide fragments, and but only the first nucleotide fragment will be labeled. So that'll be the only thing that shows up on this gel. So with the unlimiting DNA treatment, all we see are one nucleotide fragments. And again, we only see this guy, this labeled one. These guys are not labeled. Now that you understand and the basics of DNA footprinting, I want to go do a little bit, uh, I want to show you some data and then we'll interpret it together because this is likely, um, the, this, is, this is the big point, this is the culmination. So here's example three. Let me walk you through this gel. The first is if we, are, if we have added no protein. So remember when we add no protein, we just have naked DNA, it gets cut up by DNA at every nucleotide, but only once per DNA. That means that we should have a variety, oops, we should have a ladder, let me just turn off my, my Wi-Fi here, we should have a ladder that is uh, a bunch of bands that are one nucleotide different in length. And when we have our protein bound, we, our protein will bind somewhere and we'll know where that protein is binding based on this footprint, which you can see right here. And the remember the footprint is just a lack of bands. And those lack of bands arise because DNAs can't cut where the protein is bound. So if I was going to interpret this gel, I would say, okay, I expect that a protein binds, the protein actually does bind when it's added, and it binds to cover up, let's see, one, two, three, four nucleotides. It covers up four nucleotides. Well, the next logical question is, well, what nucleotides are those? And scientists can use a variety of methods in order to figure out what those nucleotides are, right? Because this only tells you how many it covers up. It doesn't tell you where it is. And so the first thing that they can do is use this, um, use this GA. And what that does is it's just a method they can use that will cut at every G and every A. So usually when you do this, you'll already know the sequence of the DNA. Um, 
and you just need to line up kind of where where the footprint is in reference to an already known sequence. And so by just having the G, knowing where the G's and A's are, that provides sufficient sequencing landmarks so you can actually align this footprint to a sequence that you already know and therefore determine where the protein is binding. So what I've done here, and this is this is generally how you'll see it done. Uh, I've 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 said okay, so this is G20. This represents A18. This represents A16. So you'll know in reference to kind of the larger sequence where this is. So you'll know that the nucleotides that are getting covered up that are being protected by the protein are let's see G8, which means that nucleotides 8, 9, 8, 7, 6, and we know this is an A6. Um, and that's it, right? So nucleotides 6, 7, 8, and 9 in the sequence are the ones that are covered up. And if I, I've so helpfully actually drawn this up here, so here's the sequence that I've numbered, um, that I've numbered in reference to the numbering here on the side, and again, indeed 6, 7, 8, and 9 are the ones that are covered up by this protein. And I've, I've, I've just made the A's and G's purple here so they're easy to see that those are the ones that were used to generate this in this lane. Uh, now if you don't have a sequence or if you just want to do a sequencing reaction you could just sequence it yourself which I've drawn here um, and that will give you the sequence information as well as to the nucleotide precision with this. So so if I was just looking at the sequencing ladder I would say okay well it's protecting uh, it's protecting a T, a G, a C, and an A and indeed uh, it protects a T, G, C, and an A as shown here. The last thing I want to talk about is how do you determine uh, which end of the DNA is labeled? And so here we go. We can see that, well, actually, cover this up. Let's not see. Don't look at that. Ah! What end is labeled? So here we see the very largest pieces are the very, um, are the ones that contain the kind of, like, quote unquote, late nucleotides, so the larger numbers, so G20. Uh, and 19 and 18. And the smallest ones have the smaller numbers, so A2, 1, etc. So if I was thinking about this, right, so imagine this is my DNA. If the small fragments are near the small numbers, I'll just write 1 here, and the large fragments are near the large numbers, I'm just going to write 20 here, we would expect the label to be on this end. And indeed, if you look over here, and you didn't cheat, hmm, uh, you would see that the small numbers, right, are near the label, so when this cleavage happens, it produces products that are small, and the large numbers are over here, and so when cleavage happens up here, or it gets cut by DNAs, then you get long products, which are shown here, and that is corroborated by this gel, where number one, these small guys, like A2, for example, which we already know, A2 is here, it's small, and then G20 is up here, it's big, and it's shown over here, it's far away from that label. Hope this video is helpful, and I hope you enjoy DNA's footprinting as much as I do.